Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll briefly introduce myself and we will begin. Uh, David and Russell over 30 years ago came in to coach me. If you can coach me, you can coach anybody. So <laughs> they did a great job. Uh, my name is Marshall. I'm from a small town called Valley Station, Kentucky. I went to school in Indiana. I got a PhD at UCLA. I was a college professor and dean when I was young. And then for 42 years, I do three things. One is I give talks or teach classes like today. I love speaking and teaching. I travel all around the world. I've been to 102 countries and on American Airlines alone, I have over 11 million frequent flyer miles. <laughs> have any of you seen a movie before called Up in the Air with George Clooney? Have you seen a movie? I have the card. <laughs> and this always happens to me with the card, especially with women. I show them the card. They always say the same thing. You look exactly like George Clooney. <laughs> So the first thing I do is speaking, and I love this. And the second thing I do, as David said, I coach executives. I'm the coach of CO Ford and Pfizer and Glaxo and the World Bank and all kinds of people. What I love about coaching is that's where I learn everything. And then I write and edit books and articles. So I've written or edited 40 books. I've done three big New York Times bestsellers. And the other 37 were purchased by my mother, my father, and relatives. So <laughs> I've done a lot of books. Now, we're going to have an interactive session. Like David said, it's good to get out of your comfort zone. Everyone is now going to pick one or two people to work with you during my session. To your marks, get set, go! Find a partner, find a partner, find a partner. You're going to shake hands with your partner and say... Partner, my name is, I'm here to help. Go, shake hands with your partner. Now, today, today we're going to talk about questions that make a difference. Building individual effectiveness and increasing engagement. Now, a couple of things. Send me an email, marshall at marshallgoldsmith.com. I love to get emails. If you send me an email, can I get back to you immediately? I will get back to you eventually. About five of you came up to me already this morning and said you sent me emails and I got back to you. So that makes me feel happy. So I can't get back to you immediately, but I'll always get back to you. And then I give all my material away. You may copy, share, download, duplicate any of my material. Just go to www.marshallgoldsmith.com. Now, what are our goals today? Simple goal. Understand how daily questions, and especially active questions, can be used to increase effectiveness and build engagement. I'm going to teach you something today that takes about three minutes a day. Costs absolutely nothing. It's going to help you get better at almost anything. So you're skeptical now. Three minutes a day costs nothing. Help me get better at almost anything. That sounds too good to be true. Half the people that start doing this quit within two weeks. And they do not quit because it does not work. They quit because it does work. What I'm going to teach you today is something that is incredibly easy to understand. It's difficult to do. And by the way, if anyone says this is easy to do, you just prove one thing to me. You've never done it before. I've been doing this for years. This is easy to understand. I can tell you, this is hard to do. Now, the daily question process. I have a woman named Jasmine call me up on the phone every day. Every day, she listens to me read questions I wrote and provide answers I wrote every day. Someone asked me, why do you have a woman call you on the phone every day? Don't you know the theory about how to change behavior? I wrote the theory about how to change behavior. <laughs> That's why I have a woman call me every day. My name is Marshall Goldsmith. What I'm going to teach you to do next, I'm too cowardly to do this by myself. I'm too undisciplined to do this by myself. I need help. And you know what? It's okay. One thing I'm very proud of in my book, Triggers, 27 major CEOs endorsed that book. Why am I so proud of this? 30 years ago, no CEO would admit to having a coach. They would have been ashamed of having a coach, embarrassed to have a coach. Today, these are 27 of the most important people in the world who stand up and say, I won the Presidential Medal of Freedom. I need help. It's okay. I'm the CEO of the year in the United States. I need help. It's okay. Now, we all need help. For example, who needs to be a better listener? Raise your hand. Better listener. Hands in. Look at all these hands. What's your first name, sir? Michael. 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 How many years has Michael been needing to be a better listener? Give me a rough estimate. Well, yeah. Decade. Over a decade. Yeah. Raise your right hand. Repeat after me. My name is Michael. My name is Michael. I need to be a better listener. I, need to be a better listener. I have not fixed this by myself in a decade. I haven't fixed it in a decade. Who am I kidding? Who am I kidding? I'm not going to fix it by myself in the future. <laughs> I need help. I need help. And it's okay. it's okay. 
Let's hear it for Michael over here. Very good. <laughs> Look, who are we kidding here? If you haven't fixed it in the last 20 years, you're not going to fix it next week. You need a little help. Twyla Tharp is the greatest choreographer, perhaps dancer in the world. She's had the same personal trainer for 27 years. Why? The trainer doesn't teach her anything new. He just makes her do what she knows she should do. That's why she looks great at 75. Well, my name is Twyla Tharp. I need help, and it's okay. Now, how does the daily question process work? Are we ready? Look into the eyes of your partner. Look into the eyes of your partner. I want you to imagine your partner is going to call you on the phone every day for the rest of your life. Every day that partner is going to call you on the phone. <laughs> now, I have a woman named Jasmine. She calls me every day. Every day she listens to me read questions I wrote and provide answers I wrote every day. Now, I'm going to share some of my questions, and here's the way the process works. You're going to get out a spreadsheet. On one column, write down a series of questions that represent what is most important in your life. Could be friends, family, coworkers, health, whatever it is for you, write it down. Every question is going to be answered with a yes, a no, or a number. Yes is recorded as a one, no is recorded as a zero, or a number. At the end of the week, seven boxes across, one for every day of the week. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. At the end of the week, that spreadsheet will give you a report card. I'm going to warn you in advance. That report card at the end of the week might not be quite as beautiful as that corporate values plaque you see stuck up on the wall. Because I've been doing this for many years, and you know what I've learned? Life is incredibly easy to talk, and life is incredibly difficult to live. If you do this every day, you get to see those live values. They're usually not quite as pretty as those talk values. Now, David, in his kind introduction, mentioned a few awards I've won. David, you did leave out one of my best strengths. I'm surprised. What is that? I have the incredible ability on a daily basis to screw something up. Have any of you impressed yourself on a daily basis with your... <laughs> ability to screw something up pretty much every day. And I keep thinking I'm going to slide through a day or two and not screw something up. No, nah, not so much. I pretty much screw something up every day. Well, the challenge of this process is you get to look at it every day. And it's often not so pretty. Now, I'm going to share my questions. My questions are not intended to be your questions. Everyone writes their own questions. On the other hand, if you want all my questions, send me an email, marshall at marshallgoldsmith.com. Marshall has two L's. I'll send you my questions, okay? What's one of my questions? Every day, how many times yesterday did you try to prove that you were right when it was not worth it? <laughs> I'm not seeing too many zeros on that scorecard. A little hard for that old professor not to be right all the time. Yeah. How many angry or destructive comments did you make about people yesterday? I don't think I see enough zeros on that one either. I mean, we want to treat people with respect. Why do we keep stabbing them in the back? We want people do this to us. How many steps did you take? How many push-ups? How many sit-ups? Did you say or do something nice for your wife? Did you say or do something nice for your son? Did you say or do something nice for your daughter? Did you say or do something nice for your grandchildren? Just questions about life. Now, my friend Jim Moore does this process, and he would tell you this saved his life. It did not kind of save his life or sort of save his life. It did save his life. What's one of his daily questions? Are you currently updated on your physical examination? The first 90 days he did this, he said no every day for 90 days. After 90 days, he said, this is embarrassing. I've got to get the dumb exam or quit asking the question. I'm failing a test every day, and I wrote the question. He got the dumb exam. What did the doctor say? You have cancer. Now, that was many years ago. He's going to be fine. The doctor also said, had you waited seven more months, you would have been dead. He knew he should have got a physical exam. He was 65 years old, chief learning officer of three multi-billion dollar companies. He's not stupid. He knew he should have done it. He didn't do it. Hold a mirror in your face every day. It's hard to hide. Everyone look up here. How many people in this very room have ever avoided a physical exam before and told yourself, I'm going to get that exam after I go on my healthy food diet and begin my exercise program? Hands up. Come on. Look at all these hands. Now, I have a question. Did we trick the doctor with that strategy? I was teaching at the University of Michigan. This man raised his hand. I said, sir, did you trick the doctor with that strategy? He goes, I am the doctor. <laughs> <laughs>
Have any of you noticed a flurry of dental flossing activity the two days before you walk into that dentist's office? Oh, we're flossing away. You have blood running all out of your mouth. You sit down, the dentist says, have you been flossing? What do we say? Oh, yeah, dentist, I was flossing. Are we really kidding the dentist here? Now, this process has produced some amazing results. And I'm going to talk about how this works not only to build individual effectiveness, to increase employee engagement. I'm a member of something called the National Academy of Human Resources at the States. These are like top HR people and a few consultants like me tossed in. I go to a presentation and they talk about employee engagement. Are all of, are all of you familiar with the term employee engagement? You know this term, very popular term. Uh, and they said, tell us everything you know about employee engagement. And they talked about recognition and rewards program and training and all this stuff. It was all stuff I've been hearing 30 years. Then they said, in spite of all efforts, global employee engagement's near an all-time low. I'm going, wait a minute. I've been hearing the same lecture for 30 years. If everybody knows so much, why is global employee engagement near an all-time low? Then I realized something. 100% of the dialogue was, what can the organization do to engage you? And absolutely 0% is, what can you do to engage yourself? This is not an exaggeration. 100% of employee engagement was the company's problem. 0% was the employee's problem. I'm sitting there listening to this. I'm, waiting. I'm going, wait a minute, you're missing half of an equation. John Kennedy had a famous speech. He said, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. 100% of the employee engagement was exactly the opposite of the John Kennedy speech. It was 100% what are they going to do for you, and 0% you have any responsibility for your own life. I'm thinking, you people are missing half of an equation. Everyone look up here. I'm on a three-hour flight on American Airlines. One flight attendant is positive, motivated, upbeat, and enthusiastic. What is negative, bitter, angry, and cynical? How many people in the room have ever been on that flight before? We've all been on that flight. Same pay. Same uniform, same employee engagement program. What's the difference? The difference is not what's on the outside. The difference is what's on the inside. Well, I talked about this with my daughter, Kelly. Now, I'm very proud of my daughter. She's, um, some of you may have actually seen her before. She's a graduate of Duke University. She was on the TV show Survivor Africa. She worked with Mark Burnett for two years doing casting for Survivor, The Amazing Race. Went back and got a PhD at Yale, and now she's a a senior professor at Vanderbilt. So daddy's very proud. And we're doing research together. And I talked about this concept of employee engagement. And Kelly said, Daddy, everything in employee engagement is focused on something called passive questions. Now, what is a passive question? Do you have clear goals? Passive question. Do you have meaningful work? Passive question. Do you have a best friend at work? Passive question. Kelly said, if you ask someone a passive question and they give you a negative answer, they tend to blame the environment. Do you have clear goals? No. Well, why not? They're confused. Do you have meaningful work? No, they make me do trivia. Do you have a best friend at work? They're all jerks. It's someone else's fault. Kelly taught me the value of acting, asking active questions, especially questions that begin with the phrase, did I do my best to? Now, these are my first six questions now every day. Did I do my best to? Now, why are these so powerful? You can't blame someone else. The one thing I have to be 100% responsibility is, did I do my best? I can't blame that on the company. I can't blame it on my boss. Did I try? Did I do my best? The first one is, did I do my best to set clear goals? Rather than saying, did the company give me clear goals, did I do my best to set clear goals myself? Number two, did I do my best to make progress toward achieving my goals? Number three, and we're going to talk about this one, did I do my best to be happy? Did I do my best to be happy? Well, we often think about happiness as coming from where? Out there. If you look at any research on happiness, most of happiness does not come from out there. It comes from in here. It comes from inside ourselves. Did I do my best to be happy? Now, I know we have several medical doctors in the room because I talked to a few of you before we started. I'm the coach now of several medical doctors, but three of the smartest people, three of the smartest people I've ever met are medical doctors. Goal number three, did I do my best to be happy? Rather than saying, did the world make me happy, did I do my best to be happy? As I was saying, I coached three medical doctors who are among the smartest people I ever met. Dr. Jim Kim, president of World Bank, simultaneous MD and PhD with honors from anthropology and Harvard. Brilliant man. 
Dr. John Noseworthy, CEO of the Mayo Clinic, probably number one hospital in the world, and Dr. Raj Shaw, formerly head of the United States Agency for International Development, now he's head of the Rockefeller Foundation. Three very brilliant men, and obviously I have the permission to use their names. All three individuals ask him this question, on a one to 10 scale, how would you score and did I do my best to be happy? They all had the same answer. It never dawned on me to try to be happy. Now, they're all medical doctors. I said, did it dawn on you you're going to die? They said, yeah, they covered that in medical school. <laughs> I said, do you think this is a silly or trivial question? They said, no, it's a very important question. I just forgot to ask. The average person that I work with on a 1 to 10 scale, did I do my best to be happy? 5.5 out of 10. Remember when you were in school? You got a 55 out of 100. Would you be proud of that score? You'd be ashamed of it. That little test is more important than that test you took in school. My advice, raise that score. Raise that score. Did I do my best to find meaning? Rather than saying, did someone else give me meaning, did I do my best to find meaning myself? Did I do my best to build positive relationships? Rather than asking, did I have a friend at work? Was I the friend? And finally, did I do my best to be fully engaged? Rather than asking, did the company engage me? Did I do my best to engage myself? Just six very simple questions. Now, the results of our research on this are pretty amazing. We do a two-week study. We send people an email every day for two weeks and test them just on these six basic, very, very simple questions. And then we do a study to measure what happened. 34% of the people that participate in our research said, you know what, I got better at everything. Just challenging myself with these six questions every day, I got better at everything. 67% says I got better on at least four items out of the six. 91% said I got better at at least one item. 9% said no change. And less than 1% of the people say I got worse. Why? Every day, these six questions get me to focus on the one thing I can control. What is that one thing? Did I do my best? Now, we're going to have a case study. Uh oh we're going to have a case study and I'm going to have you practice this. I want you to imagine you're going to go to a meeting, a boring meeting, stupid power finance slides. You're dreading this meeting. The meeting's going to last for one hour and you have no choice. You have to go to the boring meeting. Please raise your hands. How many of us have ever attended such a meeting before? We've all been to this meeting. Now, I want you to imagine at the end of the meeting, you're going to be tested. The company's not going to be tested. Your boss is not going to be tested. The presenter's not going to be tested. You're going to be tested on four questions. Did I do my best to be happy? Did I do my best to find meaning? Did I do my best to build positive relationships? And did I do my best to be fully engaged? Now you're going to talk to your partner and answer this question. If you knew you were going to be tested on those four questions, what's one thing you would do differently to raise your score on at least one of the four questions. To your marks, get set, talk to your partner. Go, 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 talk. Okay, stop, 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 stop. Let me just call on some people in the front to get some random ideas. What's one thing you would do differently? Be fully engaged, be present, be engaged, be mindful. Uh, what's one thing you might do differently? Put yourself in their shoes and try to understand what they're trying to say. Excellent. What's one thing you would do differently? I would uh, find meaning, greater meaning, by really trying to understand something that maybe I just ignored or I just... 
try to find greater meaning by really trying to understand something new rather than being judgmental. Excellent. Sir, what's one thing you would do different? Listen generously. Listen generously. Tell me what you mean by generously. Um, with full attention, similar to the previous gentleman. Yeah, full attention. Yeah. Listen generously. Let's hear it for these four good suggestions. <laughs> now, I want you to focus on what I'm going to say next. I've done that little case study with over 100,000 people from around the world. I've asked people, what would you do differently? So far, no one has ever said I would do nothing different. No one has ever said I would do nothing different. Everybody has something. Now, I'm going to give you a challenge. And the challenge is this. Do ask the questions. Why? Let's go back to those two flight attendants. One's positive, motivated, upbeat, and enthusiastic. One's negative, bitter, angry, and cynical. They're on the same flight. Who's the real loser on the three-hour flight? It's not American Airlines. They went bankrupt anyway. <laughs> it's not the customer. I'm the customer. After five minutes, I could care less about the flight attendant. I'm asleep. Who's the real loser on the three-hour flight? The flight attendant. If you're in that meeting for an hour and you're bitter and cynical and negative, the real loser is not the company or the customer. Who's the real loser? It's you. And I'm getting older, and you know, one thing you learn when you're getting older, those hours, you don't have that many. And you know that hour in that meeting, you're not getting it back. You're not getting it back, it's your hour. Make the best out of the hour. And what I love about what I just taught you today is this. Is it good for your companies? Yes. Is it good for your customers? Yes. It's better for you. It's better for you. And at the end of the day, it's not about your company or your customer. That hour is your hour. You're not going to get it back. Now, I'm going to finish with my favorite coaching exercise in the whole world. I'm now going to give you the best coaching advice you might get in this or any other lifetime. And this is going to help you write a daily question for you. By the way, the hardest question every day has four qualities. Number one, you write the question. Why is that hard? You cannot blame the idiot that wrote the question. <laughs> Number two, you know the answer. Why is that hard? Can't say you don't know how to do it. Number three, you know it's important. Can't say it's trivial. And Number four, all you have to do to make a high score is try. You don't even have to succeed. You just have to try. Why is that question so hard? Nobody to blame. It's so much more fun blaming everybody else. I've been doing this for years. You know what I've learned? I've pretty much been able to discover the source of about 99% of my problems. I only have to look one place. Where's that? Right in the mirror. Most of our problems, they're not coming from out there. Where are they coming from? In here. Now, this last exercise can help you do a great job of figuring out what's most important in your life. Everyone look up here. I want everyone to smile, smile. I want everybody to take a deep breath. I want you to do your hand like this, and I want you to go, ah, oh, hand, hand, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah. Oh. Now, I want you to imagine that you're 95 years old, and you're just getting ready to die. It's all over. Here comes that last breath. Ah. Right before you take that last breath, you're given a beautiful gift, the ability to go back in time the ability to go back in time and talk to the person in this room. The ability to help this person be a better leader, a better teacher, a better professional, much more important. The ability to help this person have a better life. What advice would that wise 95-year-old you, who knows what was really important in life and what wasn't and what matters and what doesn't, what advice would that wise old person have for the you that's sitting in this room right now? I don't want you to say anything, do anything, write anything. Just answer your, that question in your mind. What advice would that old person have for you? Whatever you're thinking now, do that. In terms of a performance appraisal, that's the only one that's going to matter. That old person says you did the right thing, you did the right thing. That old person says you made a mistake, you made a mistake. You don't have to impress anybody else. Some friends of mine interviewed old folks who were dying. I got to ask them this question. What advice would you have? On the personal side, three themes. Theme number one, 
three words. Be happy now. Not next week, not next month, not next year. Be happy now. The great western disease. I will be happy when. When I get that money, status, BMW, condominium, I will be happy when. We all have the same when. That old person looking at death, that is when. Learning point from old people. I got so busy chasing what I did not have, I could not see what I did have when I had everything. Many of you are among the luckiest people that ever lived. Many of you are educated, you're smart, you're healthy, you have friends, family, people you love. Compared to me, most of you have youth. You got it all. Don't, don't get so busy chasing what you don't have, you can't see it. Learning point number two from old people facing death, friends and family. I'm sure many of you work in nice companies. When you're 95 years old and you look around at deathbed, none of your coworkers are waving goodbye. You realize those friends and family, they're important. They're the only people here today. And learning point three, if you have a dream, go for it. Because you don't go for it when you're 40. You might not when you're 50, and you probably will not when you're 80. And it doesn't have to be a big dream, maybe a little dream. Go to New Zealand, speak Spanish. Play a guitar. Other people think your dream is goofy. Who cares? It's not their dream. It's your dream. It's not their life. It's your life. I had a very embarrassing experience a few years ago. I was teaching this class, and I said, go to New Zealand. Speak Spanish. A man raised his hand. He goes, we're in Spain, you moron. We all speak Spanish. <laughs> Business advice isn't much different. Number one, life is short. Have fun. Number two, do whatever you can do to help people. The main reason to help people has nothing to do with money or status or getting ahead. The main reason to help people is much deeper. The 95-year-old you is going to be proud of you because you did and disappointed if you don't. And the final one's also the same. Go for it. Your industry is changing. Your world's changing. You do what you think is right. You may not win, but you know what? At least you tried. Old people, we almost never regret the risk we take and fail. We always regret the risk we fail to take. And the final thing I'd like to say, it's been my honor to be here today. Many of you know, I know work to help other people. And my feeling is if I can help you a little bit, maybe that'll help you help other people even more. The other thing I want to do is thank David and, and Russell and the people from GTD that helped me so much. I always ask a question, is my life better off or worse off because I met these people? And I can say my life's a whole lot better off, so thank you very much. Thank you as well. Thank you.